fairly distinguished panel of journal editors. And when we were preparing for this, we said, let's not introduce them individually, but we'll allow them to introduce themselves and then talk about the journals. So we've selected the seven most premier uh, management and entrepreneurship journals. And so we wanted to give you the opportunity to learn more about the journals, but then also ask your specific questions to them about publishing in these journals as kind of your aspirational goal for a lot of your scholarship. So without further ado, we'll start with Tig and then come this way. I hate going first because I never know what everybody else is going to say, so I can, I can wing it. Um, my name is Tig Payne. I'm the incoming editor for Family Business Review. Pramadita Sharma is going to step down at the end of December. She's been doing it for like eight or nine years and doing a great job, and so I'm coming into a very hard position trying to take over for her. Um, family Business Review, as, as the name implies, is a uh, journal about family business. So. It fits uh, well within the entrepreneurship realm. There's a lot of overlap between what happens in family businesses and, and the entrepreneurial processes and, and things. And so there's a, there's a lot of overlap. There's a lot of people that do entrepreneurship research that also do family business. So um, I wouldn't say they're, they're the same, but I would say that they overlap quite a bit. Um, as far as the journal itself, it's a quarterly journal. We publish about anywhere from 18 to 22 articles a year. Um, we, um, we have an impact factor of 4.22. Uh, that ranks number 15 in the business category, so it's right in line with a lot of these, these others in here, but we're significantly smaller in general. Um, I guess that's basically the rundown. Um, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Oops, I think I... Oh, yeah. Um, Thank you for inviting me. My name is Marlis Christensen, and I'm uh, part of the new um, incoming editorial team at Academy Management Discoveries, which is one of the newest Academy journal. And um, I have a special role in that I focus on the media editor, so I wear an online journal, uh, exclusively on online, versus um, the rest of the Academy journals are, are moving into the online space with the dynamic editions, but ours is exclusively online. And this fits with the mission of the journal, which is um, it was actually initiated due to the Academy membership's um, wish to see more journals for everyone to publish in, so that was part of it. But then the other reason, which is a scholarly one, is there's a, there is a need in our field to create a space for work um, where people have interesting or surprising findings uh, that we don't yet have theory to explain. So it's a space for abductive research, for inductive research, when people describe really interesting phenomenon that we don't quite know the explanations for yet, so they describe them, um, they help, it's a sort of jumping off place for developing hypotheses. So we talk about it as work is at the pre-theory stage. Of course, it's important to have empirical rigor. Um, because we're new, we don't yet have an impact factor, although we're working hard toward getting that. Um, probably 2008, 2018, 2018, what did I say? 2019 is when we'll have one. Um, Google citations are looking good for our stage of journal, and there are quite a lot of visits to the web page, as you might imagine. Um, and I also check to see how many entrepreneurship papers are being published, and, and that's a really rich stream of research that's finding a home in our journal. So um, we're newest uh, academy journal and focus on things like abduction, which I'm happy to explain more about uh, questions. Hi, I'm Jeff McMullen. I'm the, uh, the new editor-in-chief of JDB, Bill Moth Dean's work. He's, he was with us for eight years and three years before that. Dean did a stellar job leading the journal. Uh, we've seen immense growth and impact factor. It's almost six. Now it's just, it, we're the premier entrepreneurship journal. We're not, a, we don't uh, consider ourselves um, a subset of anything, basically, not even a subset of management. We, we transcend management in the sense that we're interdisciplinary multifunctional, uh, multi-level, multi-contextual. If it's about entrepreneurship or interested in it, if you submit it, uh, your work, whether it's from econ, psychology, management, wherever, uh, you're going to get a field letter who is in your specialty area so that they speak your language. Um, there's a fluency there. Uh, reviewers, hopefully, that would already share the assumptions and, and interests that you share. Um, so you don't have to disguise your paper as something else, and even though it's an entre entrepreneurship paper, which is some of us have had that. If, if you've been in the field long enough, you know what I'm talking about. Um, if it's entrepreneurship, you own it. You, pre you present it as such. You make a compelling case. We want your research, whether it's theoretical research, whether it's um, whether it's inductive, qualitative work, uh, deductive, quantitative work. We're interested in it. And if you 
one of the big changes that you're going to see come out is uh, JBV is going to be more and more about promoting entrepreneurship, not just JBV. We want to promote entrepreneurship scholarship. It's a personal mission of mine to evangelize what we do and, and to break through so that entrepreneurship is held in the highest esteem by, at the highest level at every university, whether they do entrepreneurship research or not. Um, so that's one of our primary goals, and I hope you join us. Hi, my name is Johan Wick, I'm a professor of entrepreneurship at Syracuse University. Uh, I claim to fame, I guess, as I was advisor for Alex, I was also the advisor for Carl. Uh, long time ago, and now Alex happens to be my boss, so that's an interesting development. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, also, uh, I'm also incoming editor in chief for Entrepreneurship Theory and Practice. Uh, ETP is moving from, uh, going to be with a new publisher, moving over to Sage. It's going to be a lot of changes taking place from uh, when I take over and from January 1st. It's going to, the journal's going to look different and so forth. Uh, I want to say a few things about ETP would be that I always viewed it as a very eclectic journal in terms of entrepreneurship. Larger underscoring what, what Jeff is saying, that we have a very accepting view of entrepreneurship and we, we don't see it as a sub-discipline of anything else. And if there's anything I want you to take with you home from this uh, session here is that by any standards, JBB and ETP are top journals. And that's true. Daddy, I'm not going to talk about the other journals because I don't know enough about them. But it's like if you compare it to other journals in business and management, etc. If you compare the objective data, they are top journals. I think we need to to convince people that that's the case. I don't think everybody understands that the, this is really what's happening. So that's something I want you to bring with you home. Tell your, you know, your advisors, tell your deans about that. that these are these are really top journals. And I'm very much with with uh, Jeff in terms of I want to promote entrepreneurship, not just my own journal. I think we work well together. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm Sharon Alvarez. I'm uh, the new incoming associate editor at AMR. And this is an exciting time in AMR for entrepreneurship. Uh, explicitly with this new editorial team has been the acknowledgement that a lot of the papers that are going to AMR, that are going, that are coming in in theory, um, and that are being cited, are entrepreneurship papers. And so, by having someone from the entrepreneurship field explicitly on the editorial team, um, the wish and the uh, desire is to promote more entrepreneurship theory. You can also now select. Uh, or nominate, I guess ultimately the editor selects, but you can nominate your associate editor. So this is a really exciting time for the field of entrepreneurship. This is an exciting time for theory building and entrepreneurship. And um, I've handed out Think AMR buttons. I have a couple more left if anybody absolutely is desirous of one. Um, and we welcome your work. Hello everyone, my name is Frédéric Telmer. I am from Lund University where I'm at Professor, I am here representing Strategic Entrepreneurship Journal, where I've been a senior editor for the last six years. Uh, the journal has been uh, active for 10 years, it's actually its 10 years anniversary uh, this year. Uh, we are a general entrepreneurship journal, like ETP and GBV, so I do share Jeff and Joan's uh, comments on where we want to go with entrepreneurship. It is that we're looking at entrepreneurship as something that more and more people are interested in, more and more people are valuing, more and more of the big schools are uh, interested in. Uh, just before arriving here, I was at Princeton and uh, really, really eager into going into entrepreneurship and hear about what, what they can do and stuff like that in order to uh, increase uh, the impact of, of entrepreneurship research and entrepreneurship. So what is SAJ? SAJ is a journal that uh, is part of the SMS family, but uh, the people that are the editors there are likely to be the ones that also will have a DTP and, 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 and GBV. So we are, are part of the same family. So uh, SAJ is also that to be one of the first journals that you're going to target as a young scholar because it's a specialized uh, journal and, uh, and you're likely to get a lot of friendly reviewers there. And I think that that's been for the three uh, entrepreneurship journals is that we really want to work hard 
in providing good and interesting and developmental reviews to uh, the authors of the papers. Having said that, you have to realize and emphasize Yuan's point is you're very likely to be rejected. I mean, the rejection rates by the end of the day is about 95 to 97 percent uh, of the, the, the submitted manuscript. However, we try to be fast and to give you fast responses so you can go forward or continue developing your work. Thank you. I'm Mark Hoover. I'm from EPFN in Lausanne. I'm representing the Academy of Management Journal. Deputy editor there for all the manuscripts that have a macro quant angle to it. So I, I see most of the papers that come into the journal that are in innovation and entrepreneurship. And I have a team of associate editors where we have actually a couple of people who are experts in that domain as well. So I invite all the papers that are empirical, because uh, compared to, to Sharon's journal, AMR, she has a theory journal. We are the empirical journal. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't have a theoretical contribution. That's very important but we want to see data, okay? That's a big difference between the journals. And if you look at all the journals, they all have their own flavor. And also, not, not, you cannot send a paper to each and every one of these journals and think that they have the same chances of success. So really look at the mission statements. I think we have the time, time to talk about this as well. So it's AMJ, please submit your best Great. So we can turn it over to you. I'm sure you're burning to ask a lot of questions. So who wants to start? Hi, I'm Matthias. I'm from Germany, and um, of course, uh, we want to target the, the broad top journals, but also the few journals. And when I see three entrepreneurship few journals, each of which is very top, interesting, so what's the difference? Which one should I target with which? I mean, of course, if a research stream is in one journal, it's the easy choice. But apart from that, do you see differences between? should go first. I think all of us can respond. So. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, I would argue that uh, that if you're if you're looking for impact and you're looking for reach, um, I, I would go to JVB first. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else would be an insincere statement on my part. Now that said, I've published in both PTP and SEJ as well, so I've, they're they're fantastic journals. But the fact is that uh, that we have been uh, the leader of the field for over at least over a decade, if not more. Um, all signs show that we're we're on a, a fantastic trajectory. Um, I'm not talking just against other entrepreneurship journals either. We're talking about against all the mainstream management journals, site journals, and such as well. So, no. Um, so, so my point is that you're not going to lose by going to any of the three journals. So that's not uh, that's not the way to frame it. Um, what I would what I would focus on if I were in your shoes is I'd look at where's the conversation taking place. Yeah, um, so you know, and that that would be the primary guidance that I would say. Um, you know, is this something that JVB is interested in? If so, yes, um, go there and and don't let that stop you either. I mean, you can always start the conversation. You can always be the first, um, but that's probably the best guidance. I can give you one. I think this is a, not a very big thing, but uh, the review process will change slightly at ATP. So the time from when you first submit until the paper is accepted is going to be shorter. We're going to have fewer rounds of reviews, and the editors are going to be more independent vis a vis the reviewers in terms of making their decisions. At the end of the day, I mean, it's, it's all, it's a quality of the editor, it's a quality of the author that's going to determine if, you know, if it's a good enough paper, it's going to get into the journal. If it's going to, if you're going to be able to make the most of this, so that's that's going to be a change. And I think by doing this, I think the turnaround time is probably going to be shorter than many other journals. I hope that's going to be attractive. For me, it's really the, the uh, which is uh, I'm basically saying the same as Jeff, but it's sort of are you talking more to general management where entrepreneurship is something? Off your general story, then AMR and AMJ are, are, are what you should go on, assuming that you have the quality. Are you more looking to a discussion specifically to entrepreneurship scholars? Then you should target SAJ, GDB, or ETP uh, in whatever order you chose to. But uh, so it's 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 uh, how narrow versus broad your 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 paper is, 
and that's depending on what you want to do, that's also going to be shifting how you write your paper and how you rewrite your paper. So that's sort of the, the important thing to, uh, to think of. And, and, uh, and also, uh, if you have a very specific message, then targeting a, sp a specialty journal, like those, those three, actually makes it more likely that you're going to be cited as well. So one of the big problems with getting into a good journal, uh, that or a really good journal, again, in general, in R, is that there's actually only a few papers that get a lot of other sites. So most of them do get wish washed away because nobody finds them. So you want to have your paper be found by those that you read it and cite it. So, being from one of the academy journals, I, I guess I have a little different slice. And one of the things, when I said this is such an exciting time at AMI for entrepreneurship is, you know, the academy journals just, you know, because of their history, the way they've evolved, entrepreneurship work really is being highlighted now in a way that it probably never has been before. I would say that's true for A and J as well. And you're seeing more and more papers. And um, and to know that not only can you submit a paper to the Academy Journal, so not only can you submit a paper to AMR, you can at least request me as, as your editor because of the topic of your paper. And, you can, and I will give you entrepreneurship reviewers, right? who can review your paper and give you a good review. And so I think what's exciting about the Academy Journals at this point in time is the acknowledgement of entrepreneurship work as being tough work and of being capable of really hitting those journals. Um, and so I'll, I'll let you address that, Russ. But, but I, I think that's what's so exciting right now at the Academy Journals. Absolutely, I, I think um, in MJ, it, it, we had the previous editor who edited the chief was Jerry George, he's an entrepreneurship innovation scholar. And, and, uh, I was on this team as an associate editor, now deputy editor at the new journal and the new team. And, and it's, it's again, it's, it's a very prominent position to be representing the entrepreneurship and innovation for the journal. You know, but in that sense, I, I can fully agree with what Sharon has said. It's, it's, we are very open to entrepreneurship, innovation, research. Uh, and as you said, Frederick, it needs to be framed differently. You know, that the general management audience that reads the journal, uh, AMJ, in that sense, uh, and uh, from that perspective, we want to have papers that talk to the entrepreneurship scholar, but also talk to others. You know, so that if you are an obese scholar, that you might find something interesting in that paper. So the framing and how you write up the paper is actually quite different. I think that is also one of the key takeaways If you, uh, for you. If you want to write a paper for, for these journals, read the journal, Really well to understand what are the nuances, what are the what is the general thrust, what is the touch and feel of that paper, of that journal, and how should I write my paper, craft my paper so that it fits the journal? Yeah? Because the reviewers that we pick are typically from the journals uh, editorial review boards, and they know very well what how the journal is like. You know, so from that perspective, you know, you cannot just write a paper for AMJ and then. Okay, that should be rejected, send it to SEJ, and then and send it on to ETP, whatever, and, and, and send the same paper. There's a different touch and feel to it, and that takes, that's this type of experience that you only get by, by reading lots of papers. Try to see what the uniqueness of each journal is. And being rejected a lot. That's, <laughs> that's the thing that, in order to be published, you need to be rejected a lot, a lot, a lot. Uh, Carl and I had this uh, seminar uh, some years ago back in Sweden. Uh, and nobody has published it, uh, so every, it was about somewhat about publishing, and then I was sort of, uh, those that have been the most rejected was Paul and I, but we was the one that had been the most published. Uh, so you also need to be able to handle rejections, I mean, that's the, and that's the best thing is to do it over and over and again until you're kind of vaccinated against it. <laughs> Rejection is certain, publication is rare. <laughs> Um, I was wondering, um, for each journal, how significant you are qualitative and mixed method kind of a paper instead of just purely quantitative um, for those who are doing more um, case studies, maybe 
um, uh, more of those empirical qualitative works. Well, I can say at AMD the breakdown is about 50 50. So quantitative, both in terms of submissions and publications. Um, and I'm guessing in the future it might skew a little bit more to the qualitative side. Um, just because of the focus on abduction and induction. Although one of the things we're really trying to um, grapple with is, of course, the conversation in the scientific community right now um, about harking and, and quantitative data. There's quite a lot of um, interesting theorizing that I think we sh shy away from because um, in the conventional quantitative frame, it's problematic. I actually saw in the, in the June two, uh, 2017 article, there's a lovely letter from the editor um, named Jay talking about how we, we think about post results theorizing. And um, AMD is, is a, a, a place where that, I mean, that's the whole intent of AMD, to be a, a space um, for people to be um, able not to do post results theorizing, but to do more abductive and inductive research. And that can be either quantitative or qualitative, but it certainly is a friendly home to folks who are interested in qualitative. And there's um, there's a mix of editors, of course, as, a, as the case in most journals, the people with qualitative expertise and quantitative. So they're able to find reviewers who can speak to your paper and understand not only your content, but also your methodological approaches as well. Could I say something? I think it's important to understand how the journal works, the mechanics of the journal. And that is that the action editors, called associate editors in most journals, can each be the happen to be called editor. doesn't matter. But the people actually handle your papers. They make independent decisions. I don't intermingle in their decisions. They can ask me for advice. I will give that advice. So at the end of the day, it's a matter of, do you have an editor that you can convince, you know, that your work is good enough? So the important thing is, for me is to make sure that I have a large enough number of editors and I have editors that understand the kind of papers that get submitted. So one of the things I've done is I've, I've extended the number of editors. I'm aiming for having about 20 at EDP up from less than 15. And part of that is so we were able to cover a larger area of, of different types of manuscripts because we do get a lot of different kinds. And uh, among that is having people on board as editors who understand uh, qualitative work. You know? So we have, we have it now have, or starting in a couple of months time, we will have certainly experts who uh, understand uh, qualitative work and can judge you, you know, uh, the way you, you're entitled to be, be judged. I think it's really important to understand that. Um, Family Business Review, we have, uh, we are open to all different types, but the nature of the family business is often private, and therefore we get a lot of submissions um, that are qualitative in nature. Now, I'll say that we get a lot of submissions, not very many of them make it all the way through to publication. And that's largely because the quality is not there. So if you're doing high quality qualitative stuff, we'd certainly welcome that. But we get we get a lot of qualitative stuff, but it just doesn't seem to make it all the way through very often. Um, so the and that may be true for some of these other journals. We get a lot of it, it just a lot of it's not of high, high enough quality to let you see it as the output. So it doesn't mean we're not getting a lot of submissions. It just means that they just don't make it all. The way through. Yeah, I mean, I would say that. Some areas, it, it's easier. So if you're submitting in, say, social entrepreneurship, sustainability, those are areas, uh, OT and entrepreneurship, that there is a history of qualitative methods, right? So you, it's easier to find an editor. It's easier to find reviewers. When it's more of a challenge is when you are doing qualitative work for the first time in an area that's maybe been traditionally quantitative because your topic triggers quantitative experts in that area. And so... I think just having field editors that are conscious of that um, helps tremendously. I the same thing as Johan. Um, we expanded the number of field editors at JBV so that so that people could engage with that work because it takes time to develop qualitative work. Typically, qualitative work comes in more more rough than quantitative work because we don't have a, a shared shorthand many times, right? So. Um, it, it requires more effort by the editor, I think, to really dive in and, and really engage the paper. And you have to have bandwidth to do that. So you have to have more field editors to be able to do that. Um, and, but th those papers are highly cited. And they're, they're interesting, and, and they, they require an immense amount of work. So there's something we value as a journal. I, think, I would say most of the journals up here, I would yeah. think, would value them just because of that. You, know, you don't crank out a qualitative paper every, every day. You just can't. Um, and therefore, it, it, it's worth the investment as an editor. 
Uh, I think Dr. Wickman mentioned that there are going to be some changes in UTP, and Dr. Payne said that it's getting over the uh, journal. I was wondering if there are some changes that we will see as author, I mean, in terms of how the journal is going to be, I don't know, format, mission, strategy, any changes that affect us when we want to consider your journal? It's going to look different. <laughs> Just no, it's there's a lot. I mean, one one is like I said. I mean, I essentially the feel. Excuse me. When the editors they do their work independent, but their recommendation is to only send papers to reviewers twice. So essentially, they see the paper when it's first submitted, then they see the the revised paper. After that, you should be able to make a decision. So that's one one change. And also have a pretty strong opinion in terms of when the paper is ready to be published. A single paper is like a single stroke of the brush on a canvas. It doesn't tell the whole picture. And therefore I think I think it's the the very rapidly diminishing returns to having papers one round after the other getting a revise. The improvements are usually smaller and smaller each round, right? And it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of work for the authors for the editor and for the reviewers. I think it's better to publish papers that are maybe 90% done rather than kind of keep them in the system for another six months to get them 100%. Because two months later, there's going to be another paper that either refutes what you just said or reinforces what you just said or modifies it potentially. So therefore, I think it's it benefits everybody if we, if we try to get things uh, faster through the system, get, it, get them in the journal. So that's that's one thing you will notice that's different. So you won't we won't expect to get third round no. in our email. Okay. I mean, like I said, I'm not gonna force my editors. This is a strong recommendation and that they ask if they can't make the decision, I want them to ask me or the senior editors for advice. So essentially you can get a condition like set with a condition that is three pages, to take an extreme example. You know, you need to do forty five things in order to get the public paper published. But more that than rather than sending it out back to reviewers or whatever again. I, I, wanna, want to, yeah. I was going to say, Tyke, if you want to add on after <coughs> right, so I what also have to, uh, to do one. Though. This is also what SHA is uh, we're trying to do. It's, uh, in general, we do believe that the review processes are, are just too long, and uh, <coughs> as you have pointed out, the marginal effects of going beyond two rounds is close to zero. So that's also what's going to happen, and happens also in other journals like strategic organization where I'm also reviewing for. So, uh, and it helps everyone because it keeps the reviewer engaged as well because they know that I'm just going to be doing this for two, two rounds, then I, can, then I don't need to live with that paper any longer. Do you want to talk about yeah, just briefly? Um, one thing that FBR does really well is we get uh, fast reviews. I mean, we get done. We have a 30-day turnaround time, um, and we're high quality. We have high-quality reviewers as well. The thing that I would like to see different in the future is for us to have kind of broaden our scope. Um, right now, it seems like we speak to a pretty small um, scholarly audience, and I would like to pull more people in and looking for ways that whatever theory or whatever. A phenomenon you're looking at, how might that apply to family business? There's always that question that's, this may work generally, does it apply the same way to family business? And so whenever you're working on a research project, think about that, and then think about sending it to us. But we do have really quick turnaround time, and we have great reviewers, we have a great editorial board. Um, so I can say that that's a positive, that something that won't change, or I hope it won't. Right. Sorry, Melissa, I think this is um, so I, I've heard that uh, one way to uh, lessen the parking and um, increase the uh, our, uh, better our science is to maybe do uh, proposal submissions where you're, you're uh, submitting everything except for uh, your findings and those are accepted, it's just the proposal. And that way, if you do have non-significant findings, you're still adding to the conversation. Um, is that something that these uh, major journals might be considering? SAJ is discussing, but we have not made a decision in that direction yet. 
We're not going to have the proposal. No, we're not going to accept the proposal. But we will move away from the P smaller than 0.05. You know, AMR is also not going to accept proposals. But AMR has something that's kind of interesting, which I would encourage all of you to do is we have our dialogue section, sections. And those, I view those as kind of short research papers in some ways, right? And um, I really like the dialogue section. Again, they're short, they're to the point, they make a specific point, um, they, they go through re the review process. Somebody told me they went through five rounds on a dialogue piece, which I'm kind of like, oh no, that won't happen either. Um, something else though that AMR is doing, which is new, if you go through two rounds of reviews, we're not putting you through any more reviews either, but you will start to work with the associate editor on over the phone, in person, on revising your paper. So that's a change that AMR is bringing about. Okay. Uh, I know you talked a little bit before, but I would like to know what is the matching principle between the submitted uh, uh, manuscripts and uh, selecting the, uh, the editor, whether based on the topic area, or based on some theory, or based on the research methods, how do you prioritize? And also, if you selected the editor, uh, how the editor selected the other two reviewers? Is there a complementary skill, so or what, what are the rules? Yes. I'm just kidding. All those things. Um, I think there is. Uh, okay, so it's 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 not as precise as you would think, right? Because what happens is I go through this, I read the paper, I say this really resonates with this field editor. They know this topic, or they know this method, or and, and there's usually two or three possibilities usually on the board, and it, so it goes to them, assuming it, it isn't desk rejected. They look and they really read the paper and they go in deeply to decide whether they should desk reject the paper or not because they, they're going to see if there's any critical flaws or fatal flaws or anything like that. And they're going to figure out, all right, what kind of feedback do I need to make a decision on this? So it's, it's largely about they think there's some promise here and each editor has their own strengths and weaknesses too. So they're going to find reviewers that complement them but also are, have, bring a certain kind of expertise to help develop the potential of that paper. So that might be theoretical, that might be methodological, that could be the content area. And those, but then you ask those people to review and they don't always say yes because they might be reviewing for one of the other journals or three or four of the other <laughs> journals up here at the same time, right? Um, so then it'll default to the next. So you don't always get the optimal mix as the editor of who you would love to see. I mean, we have capacity in most of our systems now to link and say, I really want to make sure I have a methods expert because it's a new novel method. And therefore, if it doesn't go to reviewer one, it will default to a specific reviewer again. And that's a new feature that many of the systems have. Um, so we, we cover the bases, but you don't always get exactly who you want. So when you're requesting reviewers, don't request William Bommel if you are writing it. He's 100 years old. You know, he's not going to be the reviewer of your paper. Look, pay, well, he was 100 years old. Pay, pay attention to who's on the board. You know, make those recommendations make sense. Um, think about maybe somebody who fits that area, but not everybody in the world is requesting every single time. Give some thought to that and signal that in your introduction. It should be clear the kind of people that should be reviewing this paper. You know. Who's the community you're speaking to? Who are the members? Um, and, and signal that to your editor, because that's how they're making choices, right? They're not just willy-nilly picking names out of thin air. They're reading your paper, engaging with it, thinking, who would make sense to review? I, I'm speaking a lot. Yes. Turn it There's a little bit of artificial intelligence, whatever you want to call it, about decision support. So there are keywords for reviewers, for editors, for, for authors that you pick yourself. You can pick, you know, people you think might be suitable reviewers. There's also this thing that, I mean, I've been field editor for small business economics, journal business venture, and entrepreneurship theory and practice. So this is kind of my combined experience. And then you have the, you can kind of see who has written recent papers within with the same keywords. I can see that as I, as I select the reviewers. But then it's very much, it, it's very much this tacit knowledge. It's like, you know, this guy or, or gal knows has written something that somehow resonates with his paper, you know. 
this person hasn't reviewed before me in a long time, and I think I remember he or she does good reviews, you know. So there's a lot of these. It's almost like I'm going to build a house. You know, I need three people to help me build the house. It's really hard to say, who do I choose? Well, it's people I know, it's people I trust, it's people I know have skills. So it's, it's, for me, it's always been quite tacit. But you get some support, you know, from the system itself. But it's really hard to say. I don't know. Does that make sense? No, I agree. I would also add that, that uh, as an editor, you do spend a lot of time selecting reviewers because the worst part that can happen to a, to a paper <laughs> is that you get a bad review. That's actually not taking the review process very seriously. That's going to send you back a review that is half a page long or very dismissive or or because it's just not informative to either me as an editor or to you as an author. And uh, and that, that's the uh, that's often a critical point. The difference between a good journal and a bad journal is the quality of the reviews that you're going to get. Uh, independent if you get accepted or rejected. So that, that's sort of, uh, when we talk about increasing the quality of our journals, that's really about also increasing the quality of the reviews that are done. Uh, and so what, when you engage in that game in, in, not, in not too distant future, it's really work hard on the reviews because that helps everyone. Uh, this, I mean, I, I've been on, on that end that you have had I have scary examples, basically. Yeah. You know, but that's why I think I'm also going to make a call to all of you in here, right? To review, yeah. right? When you're asked to review, review and take it seriously. Don't just say this is okay or this is not okay or I mean, really give a quality review because you are going to be relying on that reviewer on the other end, right? It's a community, and if everybody in the community isn't a good citizen. The community starts to break, you know, break apart, and so I, I think, I think it's right, but, but you have to be the good reviewers. Short well, intermission to follow up on. Well, I just one, one, one important thing that I was never aware of as an author before becoming that we are re rating the reviewers as well. Yeah. You know, so we get the reviews back in, and I have a, a list and say, okay, this is for the five, which is great, up to zero or uh, one, which is never use this review again. Okay, so you can build a reputation as a great reviewer in each journal. And I think for each of these journals, this is the same what we're doing here. So, so be aware that, that this doesn't just you submit and this is forgotten. No, the system remembers in the rest of your life. That's special <laughs> 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 permanent record. Yeah. <laughs> and a great place to practice it is actually at the academy conference, the yeah. older academy conference, right? So if you are to submit to the academy journals and then other journals, do always review for the conference. And they also give out cash bonuses. Ricky, you had another question? Yes, so um, there seems to be an increasing awareness of problems related to an ethical practices such as e hacking or hacking. And with that, there also comes more calls for replication studies, for example, or studies that uh, report non significant findings. So do you actually see an increase of manuscripts submitted to your journals and represent that? No. <laughs> but we are very much aware of the problem. It's, it's highly discussed, and and, uh, uh, and uh, but I, I would say replication studies is among the most tough things that you can do, in the sense that it's it's uh, difficult to replicate in a good way. That is, what is it that you actually want to replicate in the study? Uh, and uh, so. The ones that have, I, have, I have had one recently on, on my table, and, and that particular paper, it was just impossible to understand what the author wanted really to replicate. Was it a general attack on everything that the certain author had done, or was it really about the theory or the data use or something like that? So uh, it's, it's uh, in that particular instance, it's just was very difficult understand yes replication but for what so I think that that's something that that you need to think about if you're interested in that type of, of work uh, but the ethical issues are, are, are highly discussed and so they're over present but I, I, I would say that in my opinion humble opinion I think the presence has increased the, uh, the last couple of years
I think it was Statistical Bulletin that published a paper a year and a half or something like that that kind of just said this P smaller than 0.05 is completely ridiculous and, and motivated why. And then they had a follow-up that came out a couple of months ago. I don't know if anybody's seen it. Uh, where they looked at the across the board of journals in all fields and said nothing has happened. So I think it's, uh, so we, I'm not talking management, entrepreneurship, I'm talking more like medicine and whatever. I think it's, yes, it's a very conservative, it's a, academia is conservative. That's also part of the reason why, why some still don't recognize that the, the entrepreneurship journals are top journals by any standards, by the way. It's very conservative. I think it's going to be a while. But it's, I mean, you're the young scholars. I mean, you have learned this already during your PhD. I did not learn that during my, when I was a PhD student. So I think there's hope. I think it's going to change. I think it's going to take longer than we might desire. Great. We'll do uh, Sylvia and then over here. Yes, I would like to know some of the um, things in entrepreneurship that you would like to see more in the future for future different journals. Mm -hmm. The topics that you would like to see more research being done in the future. Well, from, from a family business review perspective, I'd like, I'd like to see a lot more of the overlap, like uh, some topics that, for instance, Dean wrote, Dean Shepard wrote a paper on emotion. Emotion's a big part of family business. There's a lot of overlap there, theoretically, that you could find. So finding uh, topics, theories that, um, that are important uh, to entrepreneurship and finding ways to translate that into family business studies would be a really welcome thing and that's true for not just entrepreneurship but outside um outside disciplines as well finding new outside ways to, to bring those theories and ideas in and apply them i think would be a welcome thing for us so i'm going to give you the smart ass answer we want to see good work in the future right so i want to see what you think is important well done right i you're creating the future. We're, we're, we're the past over here, right? I mean, right? We, we only have so many years left. You guys are the future out there, right? So we want to see your work well done. So I give you, actually, this is the only question I prepared an answer for, so I'm very happy you asked me. <laughs> <laughs> so two things. Uh, relevance, but relevance defined in a broader sense, that there are, there are many uh, stakeholders in terms of relevance. But I think that, I mean, this is a big issue, but I, it's related to the fact that we see tenure track positions being converted to teaching uh, uh, positions around the world at business schools. And I think it's largely because uh, the research we do, we, we don't really show enough how it's relevant to the larger world. I think that's something that we can do. I also think this is where entrepreneurship has a strength relative to virtually all other things that are done in a business school. So I think relevance and broadly defined, many different stakeholders. So I think that's something I want to see, that you point out in what way your research is, is relevant. I also think more generally that uh, uh, entrepreneurship is a potential force for good in society. I think either we assume that it's always good, you know, that's something that I think a lot of people assume. That's not necessarily the case. I think it's important to look at who, if it's good or not, and in what way it's good. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples. I'm doing a special issue for JBB Academy. The deadline is not due yet. It's um, entrepreneurship and well-being. I think well-being could be viewed, for example, as an interesting outcome. Does entrepreneurship lead to well-being for entrepreneurs? Does it lead to well-being for, for their employees? And, you know, under what conditions? So I just think a broader set of, of, of dependent variables, you know, uh, I think entrepreneurship influences a lot of things, and I think we should that should be reflected in our research. But those are two two things I want to see. Okay, just adding one more thought, I think if you look at the history of entrepreneurship, we go back to the economics discipline. You think about Schumpeter and Cantillo and so on to the very early times. And I think, in a way, if you look at the research that has been published over the the decades, it's we are very strongly still, I don't want to say biased, but we are at least placing a lot of emphasis on, on things that can be counted very well in terms of performance, financial performance, and so on, you know, and all this you know, strategic management variables like I'm outperforming on a, on a revenue basis, profit basis, whatnot. But I think this does injustice to the richness of the phenomenon as such. Because if you think about entrepreneurship, it's really a reflection of all the human beings who are getting into entrepreneurship. That can be there for, for a multitude of, of, of reasons. 
know, and then performance, financial performance might be a criterion for some people, but not for others. So it, it, I think we are, we are not even there to understand really the richness of the phenomenon and how to measure performance in a way that does justice to what the individual entrepreneurs have been doing. So I think embracing that, that, that richness could be a, could be a theme that, that is of importance for the, for the decade to come. Beautiful. I wish I'd said that. That's pretty much what I was trying to say. But you said it so much better. <laughs> Go here and then over there. Yeah, I'd just like to ask you guys to speak a bit more about, speaking as a novice reviewer who'd like to stay off the reviewer naughty list, if you could speak a bit more to what you guys would consider an effective review and how to give one. Uh, intent, uh, it's like, it's like, it's like movie criticism. Like Roger Ebert, why was he a great movie critic? Because he didn't, he didn't review every movie using the same standard. He thought about what was the intent of the movie, and then he really kind of tailored his critique around the intent, right? And that takes some empathy. You have to put yourself in the shoes of the author. What are they trying to do? What's their objective? And then say, how, how could this be better? So it's not just, you have to point out the flaws, yes, but you're, you don't stop there. A good review transcends that and says, and here's some recommendations for ways that perhaps you could fix it. Anybody can say, here's what's wrong, right? And, and measure it against some, some absolute standard that no, no paper ever meets. A great review, what I'd like to see in a novice reviewer that I want to use again is they, 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 they took the time to go to that next level and thought about, hey, you know, I don't know the answer, but here's three, maybe here's three paths you can take. I think time would be the operative word. When you're when you're early and you haven't got a lot of experience reviewing, you got to spend a lot of time doing it. It's not easy, and you got to practice. So uh, it just devote a lot of time to it and, and, and hone the skill, and uh, just that 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 will help as much as anything. Time spent makes a big difference. I think that there are a lot of resources available online. I mean, AMJ does have. Quite a bit, don't you? I think so. Journal of Management has quite a bit. Also, ETP used to organize review workshops at this very conference to invite people who wanted to be reviewers, and you also even got a diploma at the end. That's something I would like for us to start doing again uh, because it's very, I mean, you kind of need to look at papers and prepare, and then you can discuss it with more seasoned people. I think that's a very good way of learning how to review. So, hopefully, next year, somebody from, from our editorial. Um, Board will uh, will host such a such a workshop. I can say that I was listening to Dean when he was talking, and I can say that if there's one common denominator between what you do as a reviewer, it's learning to give feedback to students. So if you practice doing good reviews or uh, doing good giving good feedback to students, that's a win-win situation definitely because you you will learn to do exactly what students are expecting from you or reviewers is point out what is wrong why it is wrong, and how to improve on that. So those are just kind of the three things uh, from that. So that's sort of... Let's start with what's really, right. Yeah. Take the time to start yeah. with what's right and exactly. say what are... Yeah, because yeah. too many people skip past that. And you also need to know the strengths of the paper, right? So I, I think that's important. Oh, one thing. Remember, that's what Sarah Carter always said. I think it's great. She said, remember, as a reviewer, the review is blind. It's not anonymous. Meaning that if you don't do a good job, people will know about it. Yeah, imagine, imagine signing it. I always do that. Like, I write it, and then I imagine I would sign it. You know, obviously, you're not going to sign it, but you should be able to own that review and not be embarrassed by and it. And the word, the word gets around. It's such a small community. If, if you, if, like, for example, if you get the invitations and you don't even respond a bunch of times, I mean, ever, not ever, a lot of folks are going to know about it. But you know what? As an editor, I oftentimes will pick a senior person and a junior person and to, to review. And the reason I pick the senior person is they can give me perspective and they can give me um, a real sense of the value of the paper. And the junior folks, so the, the plus to having a junior person review the paper is they are the latest in methods, in theory, in the literature. You guys know it so well. The downside is that oftentimes you judge other people's work by your work that has not yet happened. Okay? <laughs> that's, that's good. And, and so yeah. you, you need to be aware. There's no such thing as the pa perfect paper. That was your comment earlier. There's no such thing as a paper that's going to 
you know, Ronald Coase has come and gone. God bless him. He was wonderful for us. Most papers that you're going to get to review are not Ronald Coase's papers, right? So, again, kind of like Jeff said, what's good about the paper and where can the paper go? And, and you have to be super, super careful because there's not any such thing as a perfect paper. And I've seen some really harsh reviews, really harsh reviews by people who have yet to publish. Yeah, the people get more mellow when they get older and when they have more experience. Yeah, those rejections make you think about things differently, <laughs> don't they? People are kind of rest, they get more experience, no doubt. Well, they're in the survey. I had a, a question about um, submitting, and um, um, actually not about the paper, but about the letter to the editor, because you had mentioned earlier, you know, you can request reviewers and things like this, so I'm interested in knowing more. I've, I've gotten where they're like, oh, it should take you no more than half an hour to write the letter to the editor. Where there are some that are like, you need to really think about what you're saying in this letter, who you're requesting, look up who's on the board, recommend reviewers, etc. So as editors, could you share a bit about what is important and what is useful, what are you looking for in the letter to the editor that goes along with this? I find it valuable because uh, it, it, it helps you quickly understand the scope or community that that person's trying to speak to. So but even before you get into the paper, you, you have an idea of who they're trying to reach, and, and it shows that they spent the time. And now I don't want a letter where they go in and re-describe the entire paper and all that. That's really not the point. The point is that they've thought about JBV as an outlet. They're, it's not just gotten rejected somewhere else and they've sent it on to the next journal. You'd be surprised how many papers come in that you could tell they don't eat, they probably never even read JBV. I'm like, they probably just got rejected from a finance journal and they've sent it to JBV. I'm like, have you ever opened? J this doesn't look, feel, taste, anything <laughs> like a JBV. So if somebody spends some time on that letter, I know they've at least taken the time to, to think about their intended audience, why it's appropriate at JBV, who that might be, who, who may be some recommendations of field editors that, that they think would be um, uniquely suited for this, that they've got feedback from other people that they've they've sought that, they might recognize that and say, I've presented this and several people have given me feedback. A good idea, always a good idea. You should never be sending stuff in cold that's never, get feedback before you send it to the journal. You don't want to waste, burn an outlet to get that feedback, right? So I think the letter is pretty valuable in that regard, but don't, you know, you're not going to determine the outcome of the paper with the letter. Um, you're not going to win the game with that. You could lose the game by doing it a poor job and, and, and not putting any thought into it. I'd be curious what other people think. Cause I, I, I never, I mean, I submit a lot of papers to JV and I never write anything. I, yeah. Here is my paper, please consider it for publication, boo. It's just like two lines. I, do you, do you, I mean. Uh, what about other papers that use the same database? I mean, there, there are stuff, I mean, like, so to answer your question more specifically, at the new ETP, you're going to list the people you want to be your reviewers, you list that in a different place. That's not in that letter. Uh, there's also going to be this box you take whether it's been the data has been used before and then you fill out something out. But there's information like that. But it's also, you know, uh, I think it's good to, to mention if it's been presented or if there are people, you know, that uh, uh, are disqualified yeah. because they they read the paper, you know, provide you with a friendly review. So those are kinds of things it might be valuable to write. But I think Jeff gave you a great answer. I just realized I never followed that advice in the past myself. I don't so, know. So, knowing so, what to do and doing it are two different yeah, things. So right? was, I mean, so. And I honestly, I don't. Yeah, I mean, I look at the, I look at the letter. I never was able to kind of make those kind of intelligent reflections that he does. But I look at it and kind of see: is there anything in particular here I need to think about? Do you think there's anything ethically? Even I mean, you just yeah. listen to Benson at lunch and. If you even think that you're in the realm of anything like that, disclose it right up front. I mean, you don't want to get deep into the pipeline, say two, three rounds, and then have a deal killer come up then, right? So that would be the time. That would be that would be smart. You know, I That's do good. have to say something though about requesting reviewers. As an author, I never request reviewers because I found that the editors do a better job and get me better, more friendly reviewers than I do as a, as an author. So I I just I. Trust the editors, and I'm, you know, if you can't trust the editor, then don't go to that journal, right? Go someplace else. But I trust the editors. But it's very helpful, I think, because I can say, oh, why did you pick? Why did you suggest that guy? They don't have any. They got you well. 
Maybe they do. It's, just, it's not a good thing because like well, I'm not going to take that first, but maybe the other first. You know, I think it's helpful, even if I don't think it's the, yeah. the juicy gem. Yeah, but I still the editors have done well by me. Yeah. So. <laughs> So we had a comment a couple of years ago, it was about uh, the using data previously. So many times we have one, one database and we want to publish several papers out of it. And I think it's increasingly important that in a, in a letter that you say that you have used that database in, in, in other papers and how they have been used and, 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 and helpfully give the, the, the references for that and explain clearly in what way this new paper is different from previous papers. Uh, this notion of, of slicing the salami too thinly is, is something that we as reviewers are quite sensitive to. So one of the things I do uh, quite often is, is as a reviewer, I know who is the author and I know the topics, is I kind of rapidly Google name and topic and see what they have done and see, okay, if there's not too much, too, uh, too much of a close match to what has already been published. And believe me, I, we have had instances, instances, several instances, that we have rejected a paper. We won't write it, but we're saying that this is just too close to what, what has already been published elsewhere. It's just changing a variable, adding a control variable or something like that, and that's just not going to fly. So, so that's a good way of using the, the uh, that that specific letter, but uh, to, uh, uh, because that's that clear positions what you want to achieve with this new paper. Okay, Sergey. Thanks. I have some kind of provocative policy related question, and it's uh, kind of related to the rejection rates. Whenever uh, editors introduce their journal, they most of the time mention rejection rate, and it appears to be one of the major points of selling a journal. So we have 95% rejection rates, it decreased from uh, having 70 to 95 right now, and most of them it's positioned like um, an indication of increasing quality. But at the same time, well, from my perspective, it also may have some negative implications. Uh, for example, you may have uh, the decreasing percentage of people who have positive uh, outcome from their submission, therefore next time that they receive some other work, they also become more pessimistic, they reject, and therefore it's like self preventing you know, negative mechanism. Uh, and going back to uh, what Sharon mentioned, at least the way I understood it, uh, if, the senior people, if senior people have more propensity to go deeper and kind of give an outlook and like an overview uh, of the of the real value of the, of the paper, uh, the junior guys, they know so much and they try to, it, it's like a social pressure to reject the paper. Because they know that once they submit, they will also receive rejection. So what would be your opinion on that? Would you have any idea on your mind related to the change in the policy, like in the upcoming years, that the rejection rate should decrease, but instead you would have more uh, developmental acceptances or something like that? Like, we accept more because we are really engaged in the conversation. So it's like a commitment. One of the reasons why you have rejections is because, well, we have a limited number of uh, reviewers, and to save our time and make sure, uh, we need to make sure that people want to submit, they agree that the highest commitment. But you already engaged in the conversation then uh, the reviewers read the paper the first time. So it should be easier for them to help the, 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 the authors to develop the paper, right? Just two quick observations. So number one, I think uh, the perception that the rejection rate is, is some kind of negative weapon, we have it completely wrong. I think it's, and I speak I think for, for every one of us, if we say we are the author's best friend as the editors. We want to have the great papers in the journal. So when I get a manuscript, my hope is that this will sail through. And I think this is true for everyone. Right? Number two, what, what you can look at it from a different perspective. So I give you the numbers for AMJ. We have a desk reject rate of 30%, a desk edit rate of, of another 10%, so 40% of all papers get sent back, okay? Which means if you under-review, if you get your paper into the, the review cycle, you are already among the top 60% of papers. Yeah? And one-fourth of this top 60% of the paper gets a revision on average, okay? So and if you look at it this way, this is actually a much more positive process than just saying we have this 
AMJ, it's 92% rejection, which is 8% acceptance. Yeah? Uh, frame it this way. You know, in that sense, you know, I see it as an editor really like moving it from, from the first stage to the second round to the third round, ideally, and then make this acceptance. That's how I see it. You know, that's, that's, and that, I think, should be a takeaway from you. It's like, of course, you get rejected. We all get rejected from the journal. That's normal. If you're doing something very innovative, we know that from innovation research, you're getting even more likely to get rejected because other people don't understand it. All fine. Just don't give up. So, it's a very complex question, really, because it's like my publisher tells me you have a certain number of papers, excuse me, pages. At the end of the day, that this is the number of pages you can use up. But I don't have any control over the decisions. Like I said before, it's the associate editors who make the decisions. But somehow that works out. And then you also don't want to have too much of a pipeline of papers that are not yet published. So it's like you don't want to be three year, years up. But somehow that seems to work OK. Or like, say, JBV, ETP, I know those journals uh, more closely. So that, that was just one thought. Uh, so uh, but I mean, there are, so there are volume restrictions. The other thing is this thing that you can get overflow journals, like we have JBVI, which you could view as an overflow journal. I know that's probably not what Jeff and Dean want me to say. but. It's a little bit the same with the new journal now that's called Entrepreneurship Education and the Pedagogy. That can be like a little bit of an overflow journal from ATMP. The ones that are more directed that way and don't really meet the quality requirements. So that's another thing that you can kind of adjust the volume that you actually publish a little bit by having these overflow journals, if you understand what I mean. Third thing, you got to realize that there are so many, I mean, the reject, desk rejection for, for ETP, I think it's 42%. I just learned that today. And a lot of those are really, really, really bad. I mean, yeah. I think you you got to realize that... You, yeah, mean, they're not you. They're not no, the you, folks here. You see, you see the top of the iceberg here. I mean, we are the best journals that are represented here. You know, I mean, you're our outstanding scholars, excuse me, PhD students. Otherwise, you wouldn't make it into this consortium. You're probably really good schools, too. I mean, that's just not a, a good representation of the kind of papers that get submitted. I mean, I get, I get papers submitted that don't look, there's nothing about it that looks like a paper. <laughs> <laughs> it's just written on paper, you know. That's it. it comes in a box. Yeah, and it's just, but I, mean, I don't understand what they're trying to say because English is so poor. So yes. Where is so. the difference between 50% and 95 right? So what happens to the remainder? Uh, this is, uh, just coming back to, so uh, children, well, what, you, what you want to say. It's really important to remember that we get a lot of really, really lousy papers. That if you would see what we get, you would uh, you would think that 95 is not even uh, uh, that doesn't even cut it close. Having said that, you we are also looking at the the, the, the vision of research from the, the perspective of tenure and tenure track and so forth. But that's not the ultimate mission of research. The ultimate mission of research is to improve knowledge about a specific topic, in this case, entrepreneurship. So a lot of what we do is not looking forward to having you get tenure, is to look forward to improving the knowledge in entrepreneurship. And that goes through hard work and hard science in, and, and good design. So you do, if you're well trained, if you go to those kind of consortium, if you get your hands on the best possible date and so forth, then you will get it published. But if you don't do that, you will not get published. I mean, the, 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 the mission behind the journal is not to help people to get published, it's to improve research, knowledge, productivity. That's the ultimate of a uh, mission. So you have to remember that. Uh, so Hans is, when we say, do you have a contribution? Have one, then you would get them published. We we'll have time for one more question. You've been very patient in the back. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so I want to know, beside the reviews that you get from reviewers in terms of comments that are specific and shared with the authors, usually there are spaces that reviewers can share mm -hmm. comments directly geared toward you. What kind of thing do you want to see on those comments? So the question was in the uh, kind of the anonymous comments directly to the editor that the authors don't see what types of information would you like to see in there? I like to see the bigger reflection. Like, yeah. you know, I think this is a, I think this is a really bad paper, a really good paper, or, and, and you know, just the, the big picture. And I really appreciate, that's another 
That's a great question because I really appreciate it. It's, it's a great help for me uh, when the reviewers actually fill it out. So a couple of sentences is perfect. An overall assessment. In very plain language. Yeah. Yes. That's don't, right. don't have to be no. diplomatic about it. Not Just at all. say it in plain language yes. what you think. <laughs> yeah. I'll, as a reviewer, too, sometimes what I'll do is I'll, I'll also say how committed I am to that decision or that recommendation I made. So, like, I, I'll say I could go reject or I could go yeah. revise and resubmit right. here, depending on the other yeah. reviewers, just a signal to the editor that That's that cool. I'm flexible or whatever, you know, that I'm, or other times I can just say this is an absolute rejection. It's just, it's this is a critical flaw here, and, and I, I really believe in that recommendation so that they know how to weight it to some extent. Although you should know, because I think sometimes, oftentimes, young scholars don't realize this, but a reject and resubmit, or reject or whatever, is an editorial decision. Yeah. It is not a reviewer's decision. You can make a recommendation to us, but ultimately, that is the editor's decision what to do with that paper. So now we have four minutes left. So do you have any final thoughts or final advice on publishing in your journal? I'll give you a tip. I mean, I, mean, I think that it's helpful to think about is that as we're going to, everybody talked about going to less rounds. So often you've worked on your paper for like two years, you know, and and then you submit, and I, I hope that it's the best job you can do. You've gotten feedback from people. You've caught those obvious mistakes. However, once it goes to those three reviewers and that editor, they have their voice too, right? And now it becomes our project, not just your project, <coughs> because they're investing their time, and, and, and they're not rewriting your paper, but they have a voice there. What's really difficult is now you have maybe three, four months to say you get that revision request. Related because you, you know how difficult that is. It's extremely difficult to achieve in those three months or four months what you just achieved in two years, right? So that why I tell you that is make sure you're sending the best work you can at the beginning of the process. I like a reject and resubmit is not a bad decision for you. A lot of times what it means from the editor is that I think there's promise here, but you sent this in too early and I can't get it there in two, three rounds. It's going to be four or five rounds and I, I think this could get there. But it just can't in this short, truncated life cycle um, that we operate under. So, so don't take that as discouragement either. Actually, that's that's not a bad sign as well. So, two things: uh, high risk, revise and resubmit is the best outcome you could ever get from a best sum, first submission to a good journal. If you get that, don't screw it up. You know, you really, really focus on you know doing the things that that, that are, are are asked from you. Because it like uh, Mark gave you the numbers, you know the the probabilities. If you make that that far, that you actually will get published. And it's also important to realize that the reviewers have, and the editor they are not paid. They're taking time out of their own work or spending time with their family to actually give you feedback on your, uh, you know, on your research. If they have misunderstood something, that's your problem. It's because you weren't clear enough in, in, in how you communicated your, your message. I know some PhD students of mine that get angry with the reviewers and the editor because they, they didn't understand what I'm trying to do. Well, the, the burden on proof is with you. Uh, so that was number one. I had another more important point, but how the hell could I forget that? Uh, uh, yeah, I'll come back to it. But you know, the fact that the journals are moving to fewer reviews means that so, whereas I used to look at, so I was an associate editor for SEJ for a while, and if I thought a paper needed three or four rounds of review, I was actually okay with that because we were we were working on trying to build up our pipeline, we were being extremely developmental, and so I was much more willing to take a risk on a paper that if I've only got two reviews, two rounds of reviews, I'm not taking a risk on that paper anymore. So what that means is, A, the review process will be faster, but B, to Jeff's point, you had better have a better paper when you send that in for review because that means if we don't think it can make it in two rounds, even if even if we think it has lots of potential, it's done. 
I think that if you get to revise and resubmit, especially as a junior person, make sure that you have senior people reading and helping you with interpretation <coughs> of the reviews. Uh, my experience is many times that if a junior people person gets a, a, an R and R, they totally distraught and uh, they think that they would never be able to achieve it, and so forth and so forth. But with the help of a senior person that is used to reading uh, reviews and is used to being rejected and so forth, they will read between the lines. They will help you and they will guide you in, uh, in redrafting the, uh, the paper. So having somebody that co-reads the review with you is really, really helpful. And also, don't hesitate to, to, uh, to send out the, the reviews in, in an internal seminar. So you have multiple people giving their perspective on how to improve that paper uh, from the perspective of the reviews that you have received. Uh, that uh, is often uh, really important because it's, it's, it, it, it is overwhelming to get your first R&R because you just don't know how to navigate the, uh, the kind of, of, of feedback that you get. Yeah, I think on that note, it's, you can almost think like, like these are different skill sets. One is to, to come up with an original research question, write the paper submitted the first time. Once you have two or three reviewers who are commenting in addition to the editor, you have to work with these three, four people, and you have to understand what they mean with their reviews. You never need to understand what the general thrust is of what they try to tell you. And I think this is this is like the goal-getting ability. You know, the first one is to get, like, like in Europe, there's soccer is big. You know, you first you have to get the penalty kick, and then you have to kick. You know, but but not everyone who's the the great soccer player can do the best penalty. You know, so you really try to to think that this is an, another set of capabilities that you need to develop and. Don't be shy to ask senior colleagues for the, for the feedback. Great. So thank you all very, very much.